Sergeants, please begin your recordings. Recording in progress. Computer recording is uh, started. Chambers is started. Cloud recordings on the way. Good morning and welcome to today's hybrid here New York City Council hearing of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video to minimize disruption. Please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning. I am Council Member Barry Grudenchik, and I'm going to gavel in right now. I will be chairing today's meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchise. We are joined this morning uh, by Council Members Laurie Cumbo, who is also our Majority Leader, and Diane Ayala, Joe Borelli, and Sylvana Brooks Powers. Today we will be holding public hearings on Beach 67th Street rezoning the 133rd Beach 116th Street rezoning, both relating to property located in the Borough of Queens, and the 840 Atlantic Avenue rezoning relating to property located in the Borough of Brooklyn. Before we begin, let me recognize that today's subcommittee is conducting its business in person for the first time since March of 2020. This is a result of the governor recently lifting the COVID state of emergency and restoring the normal operation of the New York State Open Meetings Law. As we work our way back to our pre-pandemic operations and customs, we will continue to accommodate public testimony via Zoom, and we will also take testimony from members of the public who wish to testify in person. Whether you are participating in person or via Zoom, anyone who is here wishing to testify will be given the opportunity to do so. To all of you, we say welcome. If you are here with us in person and you wish to testify, please be sure to fill out a speaker slip with the sergeants at arms, indicating your full name, the project name or land use number, and whether you are in favor or against the proposal. For those of you wishing to testify remotely, you must also sign up by pre-registering online. You may do that now by using the Land Use Division registration link available on the Council's website at www.council.nyc.gov. For each of the hearings held today, applicant teams will be called first to testify, followed by members of the public. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit instead of appearing here before the subcommittee, you may email it to land use testimony, that's all one word, at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the land use number or the project name or both in the subject line of your email. Anyone wishing to obtain an accessible version of any of the presentations shown today, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Finally, please note that just as with virtual hearings, the logistics of conducting what is a hybrid hearing today may require breaks or pauses as we coordinate everyone's participation. We ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues that may occur. Today's first hearing uh, will be on Beach 67th Street in the Borough of Queens in Council Member Sylvina Brooks Powers District. With that, I am pleased now to open the public hearing on related pre-considered land use items for the Beach 67th Street rezoning proposal seeking a zoning map amendment under ULERP number C20023 O ZMQ and a related zoning text amendment under ULERP number N200231 ZRQ and relating to property in Council Member Brooks Powers District in Queens. I remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify remotely on this item, if you have not already done so, 
you must pre-register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. If you are here today in person and wish to testify, please see the sergeant at arms to fill out and submit a speaker card. Uh, at this time, I would be happy um, to hear uh, from Councilwoman Brooks Power if she has anything that she'd like to say. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, first, thank you, uh, Acting Chair Gradnick and my fellow council members. Um, as well as the representatives of the Beach 67th Street Project um, for being here today and for the opportunity to talk about this upcoming project in my district. Over the course of the application timeline, I have met with my constituents and the project's developers in public meetings, including community board meetings. I've heard my, from my constituents loud and clear First and foremost, I recognize the pressing need to create affordable housing across the city. I particularly approve that this project will provide affordable housing for our seniors. Older adults are the keystone of our community, people who have worked their entire lives to find a place to live that is affordable and comfortable. They deserve our continued support. I also value the inclusion of the school boosting our district's access to education. My constituents have spoken in favor in public meetings and votes for the senior housing and schools specifically, and we are confident that these two developments will benefit our community. We also know that the nursing home component of the project um, as well, um, the nursing home has been a part of our community for quite some time, and we look forward to continuing to work with them to provide vital care for our seniors. However, we wish to have the nursing home removed from the application. It is important that the contents of development projects be clear to the public when those projects are considered for public vote. My constituents have not been provided that clarity, and with that in mind, I look forward to hearing from the developers today and from the members of the public. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, the first panel for this item includes Richard Lobel, Land Use Counsel for the Applicant, Erica Keller as the Applicant, and Brian Dobrolski, the Project Architect. We also have Amanda Iannotti, Alfred Cofield, Kevin Williams, Max Meltzer, and Michael Monteleone, and if I mispronounced your name, I ask your forgiveness, um, as supporting members of the applicant team, but who are on hand to answer questions only as needed. This applicant team will be testifying remotely, so I will now ask that they be promoted and un unmuted and counsel, if you would please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel, PC for the applicant. Erica Keller, Breeze for the applicant. Brian Dabrowski, Think Architecture and Design for the applicant. Thank you. Amanda Iannani, Sheldon Lobel, PC, for the applicant. Reverend Al Cockfield, applicant. Kevin Williams, Equity and Environmental, for the applicant. Meltzer, Equity, for the applicant. Thank you. Do we have Mr. Monteleone? Yes. Panelists, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee in an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. I do. Thank you, council. Um, we have received your slideshow for this presentation, uh, for your proposal, and when you are ready to present it, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff and slides will be advanced when you say next. As a reminder for the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now, Mr. Lobel, you and your team may begin. Thank you. 
Thank you, Acting Chair Grudensky. Good morning, Richard Lobel from Sheldon Lobel, PC for the applicant. As introductions have already been made, we would launch into the presentation. If someone can post that on the screen, we'd be happy to run through. So, with regards to the Beach 67th Street rezoning, the project summary contains what is sought by this application. The first is a rezoning of seven lots on our block, one lot across the block. Uh, and we, the rezoning would be from an R4A to an R6 district. Um, this is involving a 31,000 square foot contiguous lot, uh, seven properties owned or uh, controlled by the church. Um, and this uh, would permit for the development of two main buildings. The first is a use group two nine story heirs building uh, on three of the lots with roughly 58,000 square feet and 84 dwelling units. The second being a use group three, three 11 story school building for a charter school or, or um, an association of charter schools with roughly 72,000 square feet. Of course, as with any rezoning pursuant to mandatory inclusionary housing of this size, there would be uh, the imposition of a mandatory inclusionary housing area over the sites, um, mapping both options one and two. Next slide. So here you can see the zoning map and uh, it should be coming up on the screen. This is an area which is zoned, currently zoned R4A, which was zoned R4A in the Rock, Rockaway neighborhoods rezoning in 2008. So what can we see from the zoning map here? We can see that there is a good deal of R6 zoning uh, south of Beach Channel Drive to the south, roughly 84 blocks. So this is an area where uh, R6 zoning is well known and is established as far as the context of the area. In the immediate vicinity of the building, we actually have some taller buildings. Next slide. So you can see the tax map, which demonstrates the R6 and the extent of the R6 district, both on the east portion of Beach 67th, as well as the western portion, encompassing currently the nursing home. Um, we note that Beach 67th Street here is not merely a wide street at over 75 feet, but a wide street at 85 feet, wider than other properties and, and streets within the area, making this an ideal location for the proposed zoning change. Next slide. So the land use map demonstrates the building types in the area, including both the eight-story nursing home to the west of the site, the five-story and with larger floor-to-ceiling heights, closer to six-story school building to the east of the site, as well as numerous religious institutions and community facilities such as other nursing homes to the south of Beach Channel Drive. So um, this is an area where, when you look at the context of the area, buildings as are proposed here of nine and 11 stories definitely would fit within the area. And we are so thrilled that the community board and the Queensborough President Office have both uh, expressed their interest and support for the proposal. Next slide. So I think what we would do with the remainder of the presentation, again, we will be brief and have the entire panelist team, as well as others available for questions, is just to run through some photos of the immediate area. If you want to page through the next three pages, you can see both pictures of the site, as well as building types in the area. Uh, after looking at these photos, some of which demonstrate the larger buildings in the area, um, there'll be a, a page showing the highlighted area in red, and after that, I would um, defer to Brian Dabrowski who can run through the architecture of the project. Uh, after which, I know that Erica Keller is available and can answer some, uh, give some discussion regarding the program and affordability at the site, as well as um, uh, Reverend Al Cockfield who can discuss a little bit about the program upon questions from the uh, council members. So with that, I would hand this over to Brian who can briefly run through uh, the proposal with regards to the buildings. Brian? Hi. Um, here you'll see an aerial photo, uh, which is showing the location of the two new buildings as discussed. Next slide. Um, the yellow on the left is the existing church building, which is going to remain on the property. All of the existing vacant lots are going to be merged into one zoning lot. And where you see the orange is where there's going to be the new heirs residential building. And then to the right of that, there'll be the community facility, which will be a, a school, charter school. Next slide. Again, these are, these are this is a zoning uh, analysis of the site. Everything is as per uh, code and as of zoning. Next slide. 
you'll see here the school, the existing church on the left is two stories. The residential building is nine stories and the school is 12 stories. Next slide. Uh, and just another view showing that. Next slide. Next slide. So here's a site plan um, of, the ex of the development. At the front of the building, there'll be entry to residential where you see the yellow. Uh, to the right of that, there'll be entry to parking. Um, and then at the rear of the building, there'll be a rear garden for the seniors to use and as well as um, uh, a permitted obstruction at the school building, which will be a gymnasium inside that building. Next slide. Here's a rendering of the uh, Ayers residential building. It's nine stories. The building is block and plank. Um, you know, we're using light materials that we think will be positively suited to the area. Uh, you know, fiber cement cladding on the outside, and then a bright entry for the seniors that acts as a marker in the community. Um, again, the building is nine stories uh, total, eight of those having residential and the ground level, which is in the flood zone, is having is just building entry storage and has is wet flood proofed, as well as parking underneath the uh, entry on the right. Next slide. Here's a floor plan of the ground level. So you'll see the lobby, which provides access all the way through the site to the rear garden. To the right of that, there is uh, currently six parking spaces, which is as per code. Uh, to the left of that is building storage, bike storage, uh, trash, and any program that is allowed to be within the flood zone, which these all are. Uh, this level will be wet flood proofed. Next slide. Because we're in a flood zone, the mechanical spaces need to move up to the next level. So on the left, you'll see where we have our mechanical spaces. And then there's community rooms, um, uh, program offices for administrative, and then residential, which you see in the uh, orange and red. Next slide. Again, more uh, residential. At the back behind the elevator, we're providing a small community room that provides views for the seniors, which also becomes outdoor spaces staggered through the levels. Next slide. At the setback, we're also providing a community room right next to the laundry room, which has access to the setback at the roof. This, this allows for the seniors to have um, social interaction and meet different people in the building, creating a greater community in the building. Next slide. And then above that, there's another residential level. Next slide. The roof will house normal mechanical spaces as per code. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a drawing showing where all the flood vents will be, uh, which we need to provide in order to be within the flood zone. They all get, again, all's code. Next slide. And then here is a rendering of the school building to the right. This is very preliminary right now because uh, the, the plan for the development is that the residential building will be complete before the school building starts uh, construction currently. Um, so this is very preliminary. We still need to work it out. But the ground level has parking and building entry again, which is all per um, code. And then above that, there'll be uh, levels with classrooms and gymnasium, et cetera. Next slide. Brian, with that, I think we may want, given the illustrative nature of the school, we may want to just go to the last slide in the presentation. Um, sure, that, that's and fine. Maybe have Erica talk. We're happy to answer specific questions, but maybe Erica can just talk briefly about the uh, program for the entirety of the um, affordable. And then um, again, happy to answer any questions from the council members. Thank you, Richard. Um, good morning to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present this project to you this morning. Um, we have partnered with HPD and are proposing a SARA program, so Senior Affordability, where the project will offer 83 units of 100% affordable housing for seniors age 62 and above using federally funded project-based vouchers. Um, there is a cap where seniors must be at 50% and their families must be at 50% AMI and below. 
We are offering both studio and one bedroom apartments. There will be one two bedroom apartment, which would be designated as a non-income generating unit for 100% full-time superintendent for the building. Um, there is a 30% set aside currently for formerly homeless seniors. And because we are working with project-based vouchers, there is a preference for New York City. So applicants will come from across the city. However, we know that there is a tremendous need for affordable housing for seniors um, across the boroughs. Um, we are um, ensuring that we're meeting the requirement as per the SARA program, where we have 4% of the building envelope is set aside for social services. So there will be a full-time social service provider um, to the building. Um, we have partnered with Hannock, who is well known across Queens County for their service of seniors. Um, there will be a full-time social worker available to the residents as well as a part-time caseworker. On the second floor, we'll have a communal space where there will be um, opportunity for classes as well as independent social service provision for the seniors. Um, and we will have additional communal spaces throughout the building to support the seniors um, in the building. Um, we are also ensuring that we have other amenities for the seniors inclusive of recreational spaces in the rear of the building. We have an open plan as designed by the lobby to again support communal as well as sort of a porched area for seniors who will be using city amenities such as accessoride. Um, I think that pretty much describes the affordable program. We are seeking subsidy from HPD and tax credits through HCR and are currently applying for their summer round for construction and permanent loan financing, um, which is a competitive round for 9% tax credits. Um, in reference to the charter school, that program is less defined, but we are having conversations with currently operating charter schools as well as um, new charter schools and are looking to propose an elementary school and servicing approximately 500 students um, that would be inclusive of a pre-K program as well. Thank you, Erica. And with that, we would conclude our presentation with two brief notes. The first is that the last slide demonstrated that Reverend Cockfield uh, received more than 30 petitions from residents in the immediate surrounding area. This has really been a true um, collaborative process with the community. And second, we would also thank Council Member Brooks Powers who facilitated these conversations and has produced what we think is gonna be just a fantastic proposed development uh, for this area, which is going to you know, bring much needed affordable housing and also high quality educational facilities to the, to the local area. So with that, we're happy to answer any council member questions. I thank you, uh, Mr. Lobel and your team for your presentation. Uh, before we proceed further, we just have a technical clarification and I would like to note that the sign-up link for the remote witness registration is, in fact, www.council.nyc.gov forward slash land hyphen use. So um, that is the actual registration this morning, and I thank you, um, all those who take advantage of that. Uh, we're now going to hear questions. Uh, from the council member who represents this district, I'm happy to introduce uh, council member Salvina Brooks Powers. Thank you so much. Um, so my first question is just point of clarification. I just wanted to confirm if as a part of the developer team today, is there anyone that is representing the nursing home? So council member, uh, the answer to that question is no. The um, Rezonings in the city generally include lots that are not owned by the applicant. So typically, while the applicant owns, for example, this development site, uh, the, the nursing home would not need to be part of the application. And in, indeed, in most cases, applicants include properties around the site. So uh, the answer is no. Um, you know, we represent um, the church, and we're here with the church and with Brissa, but there's no representative from the nursing home. Thank you so much. Um, and the 
I just have a few brief questions. So one, I'd like to know if the school plan to be open um, at this site, um, would they be amenable to uh, open it up the school after hours to provide after school programming for the community? Erica? Yes, so definitely um, the conversations that we have had and continue to have are all inclusive of a robust after school program as well as possibly weekends as well as um, a lower grade. So looking at the younger grades as well as previously mentioned, we're looking at you know the three year olds and four-year-olds, as well as a robust after-school and social services and amenities for youth on the weekends. Thank you for that. And I just wanted to underscore how important this is, especially with the, the rise in gun violence taking place in, um, across the city, but especially in, in um, the local community. Um, we are looking to create um, spaces where our kids can really be kids and you know having access to the schools after hours is critically important um, from the local community whether they attend the school or not so I'm happy to hear that that is something um, that you plan to do. Um, the next question I have is how are the developers engaging with local the local workforce as well as M WBE members as well as it pertains to um, the build out of this project? So we are currently currently engaged with NADMOC construction um, and we are working with them through the pre-con of the pre-construction services. And we've spoken um, very strongly about our expectations regarding MWBE participation. We have to meet certain city goals as well as state mandates um, since we are being financed uh, through HPD subsidy program. However, we intend to exceed those and have a plan to do so. We do point out that this is um, a prevailing wage project in that um, the federal voucher program does trigger prevailing wages. And so we're you know, robustly talking to the um, contractor about that fact because we wanna ensure that um, that mandate does not preclude participation of minority and women business enterprises as it often does because of the requirements regarding certified payroll are very robust and expensive. And so we're working and we're thinking strategically about how to ensure that we have equality and exceed um, the minimum expectations. We've also been introduced to a local CDC um, at Ocean Bay that has been successful in working with developers through the NYCHA developments and we intend to work with not only that one, but also other CDCs to ensure that we have local participation in reference to um, laborers and the, the direct hires from the general contractor. And we've been in communication with them in reference to that as well to ensure what our expectations are as the developer in reference to exceeding minimum requirements for local hiring. Thank you so much for that. And I definitely encourage the developer team to um, work with my office. However, we can you know, be supportive in promoting the opportunities that you have to the greater community. Um, we're here to do that too. Um, so thank you so much for responding to my questions. Thank you, council member. Um, do any of the other council members who are here have questions? Okay. Um, I have a few questions for the development team, and uh, my first one is, um, we saw the, the staging for um, the proposed development, and uh, my first question is, what is the rationale for approving higher density zoning districts in the middle of the block and leaving the corners at a lower density? It's kind of odd, uh, odd looking, certainly, and I have been around uh, a while. I don't remember seeing that before. Maybe I'm... I just wanted to know why that was done. Sure, um, Rodnick. So the rationale here was that, first of all, they looked at the, uh, and when I say the city planning looked at the local area and what zoning districts would provide additional square footage for um, a school and a religious institution. And so the R6 zoning district, despite the fact that it's non-contextual and typically is not the subject of a rezoning, 
here, the prevalence of R6 throughout the area, and again, we mentioned that 84 blocks to the south of Beach Channel permit R6. Uh, city planning really felt that that was a strong rationale for allowing this particular zoning district. And in our, uh, in our discussions with the department, it was clear that this is something which is familiar to the area. The fact that this block exists along an 85 foot wide street and has such good access, the fact that the A train runs along Beach Channel within blocks of this uh, property, as well as um, bus lines which run along Beach Channel, all of these things led to um, the imposition of an R6 here and, and that selection. Uh, while it is true that oftentimes rezonings will, for purposes of context, go to the end of a block, here the existing R5D, particularly to the south of the, of the site, which already permits a 2FAR, uh, was seen as being of sufficient context to allow for uh, redevelopment should it occur for residential in that area. Uh, it, was, it was more that Typically, if you see an island of R6 uh, among other zoning districts, it might raise concerns specifically with regards to spot zoning. But here, given the uh, length of the development site, particularly the lot area at 31,000 square feet, city planning felt and we could defend a land use rationale which said that this large area uh, merited its, its basically this zoning district. So there wasn't the same concern that you were saying, well, this would just ruin the context. Uh, you know, contrary to that, the existing context of the area and the existing R5D allow this to kind of work seamlessly. So that was the decision not to rezone. Thank you uh, for that answer. Um, did the EAS rec analyze a reasonable worst case development scenario showing the nursing home as a projected development site and resulting in the future displacement of the existing facility and its residents? So um, I'm going to defer to Max Meltzer from Equity um, on the technical aspects of the EAS. What I would say, and Max can, you know, can support this or provide additional information, is that given the context of the, context of the existing nursing home, the existing nursing home is, is very overbuilt. So it's uh, at, I think, roughly a 1.4 FAR or greater, um, maybe even up to a 1.7, maybe Max can correct me. The proposed uh, rezoning would result in a, a potential floor area for that nursing home of roughly 2.43. So when city planning looked at the potential redevelopment, they said, okay, given the fact that you've got an existing nursing home here, which is overbuilt with regards to floor area, which is not permitted at this height under the R4A, um, we're going to essentially uh, assume that even with the action here, it would be rezoned to remain. Again, the property that's included in this, the nursing home has a parking lot to the south of the site. That was not included. They specifically rezone this nursing home as they do to other properties in order to allow for the nursing home to be compliant. This rezoning takes that nursing home from being way under compliant to being compliant. And so I think that was part of the rationale for uh, inclusion in the rezoning, but also importantly, um, not penciling out a, a scenario which involved redevelopment. Max, is there any, uh, if I may defer to Max, is there any additional commentary you'd give? No, so Richard, everything you said is 100% correct. And um, just to reiterate, the, the reasonable worst case development scenario analyzes the nursing home site as a projected development site. In this case, it's projected development site number two, purely for purposes of showing a more conservative analysis. Um, you'll also note um, the EAS points out that it is unlikely that the nursing home would be redeveloped or um, or displaced. But again, it is analyzed solely for purposes of showing a more conservative analysis. Um, and again, I want to reiterate um, that the EAS uh, that the EAS points this out. It, it, it in their text is in the EAS that states that it is unlikely to be redeveloped. Um, and Richard, you're, you're correct. Um, it is uh, that the, the, it, the nursing home would be, uh, would be compliant under the proposed rezoning, um, which is why it was, which is part of the rationale for including it in the, the, the uh, land use actions. And just to clarify, that nursing home is at an FAR closer to 1.4. It's at a 1.3. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you for your answer. Um, 
The applicant and environmental review mentioned that the nursing home is not currently in compliance with the existing zoning. Could you explain exactly what about the nursing home building is not compliant with the current zoning? Of course. So I would just start, and again, Max can supplement my answer with a discussion of floor area ratio. Um, the existing nursing home being at a 1.37 is well over the permitted uh, community facility floor area that would be um, permitted for a, a modern nursing home. So um, it, it's, it's far over on bulk as far as square footage is concerned, as well as uh, height, the R4A offers an absolute height cap, I think maybe of 50 feet. Uh, the nursing home right now exists at eight stories. Um, Max, is that your understanding as well? That's correct, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, the property, as you stated in the testimony today, is in a flood zone. Uh, my question now, is the flood emergency response plan outlined in the EAS a requirement for the applicant? Max, I would just defer to, to, to that conversation to you. Sure. So um, you're, you're, you're correct. Council member, the, the project yeah. is in um, flood zone, and you'll note that the EAS um, um, outlines several, uh, the project triggered several policies that we analyzed um, and the EAS um, provides recommendations uh, for, for flood damage reduction elements and controls, um, et cetera. Um, and again, the, uh, the, pro the project is the projects in the floodplain and the project was found to not have uh, to not have to not show any severe impacts. And again, it's all stated in the, the EAS um, the, the ways in which um, the recommendations that are that are recommended that are, that the applicant uh, plans show better in the appendix um, for, for for excuse me for proposed flood protections. All right, um, I do want to make. Uh point is saying we have been joined uh, at this hearing now by Council Member uh, Carlina Rivera and also by Council Member Steve Levin. Um, you mentioned in the testimony, somebody did, that um, the mechanicals for the building, of course, have been raised. Um, could you identify some of the other specific components of that plan that you're working with? and um, other resiliency measures that might be optional but that the applicant is pursuing in this plan. Brian, are you uh, that? Yes, yes, yeah. So our base flood elevation is uh, plus one, is our BFE plus one is 10 feet. So our building is actually raised two feet and eight inches above that. So level two for us is 12 foot eight inches uh, above our base plane. Um, so that is one measure. Um, we're required by, because we are in a flood zone, to have mechanical spaces have to be above the flood plane. So that's why, you know, our electrical room and a few other ancillary mechanical rooms are located on the second floor and not on the ground level. On the ground level, we're allowed to have building entry per code um, and storage and parking. So those three are the only elements that we have on that ground level. And we're also uh, required to provide some uh, flood, flood uh, proofing. So there's wet flood proofing and dry flood proofing. We're providing wet flood proofing. That's, uh, we showed a diagram that has all of the vents and all the locations. So we have to have a certain amount of vents in every room so that if water got in, it had the ability to get out, as well as use resilient materials, which we are using in those areas in case water does get in. Um, all of the habitable space is above the, the floodplain uh, by you know, a higher height than is required as well. Thank you for that response. Um, I have no further questions. Uh, Councilmember Brooks Powers, anything else? No, thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions from the panel, um, 
Uh, the applicant panel is excused. Um, we have no nobody currently test, uh, registered to testify, so um, if there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the Beach 67th rezoning panel, please press the raise hand button now. Or for those who are here in the chambers, please see the sergeants now to prepare a speaker card and the meeting will briefly stand at ease for about 30 seconds. All right, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the Beach 67th Street rezoning proposal under ULARP number C200230 ZMQ and N200231 ZRQ, the public hearing on these pre considered land use items is now closed and they are laid over. I will now open the public hearing on the pre-considered land use item for the 133 Beach 116th Street rezoning proposal seeking a zoning map amendment under ULERP number C210148 ZMQ and relating to property in Council Member Ulrich's district in Queens. Once again, for anyone wishing to testify remotely on this item, if you have not already done so, you must pre-register online and you may do so that you may do that now by visiting the council's website. If you are here today in person and wish to testify, please see the sergeant in arms to fill out and submit a speaker card. Uh, the first panel for this item includes Elise Folidari, I hope I pronounced that right, land use counsel for the applicant. Uh, she will be testifying remotely so that so I will now ask that she be promoted and unmuted and counsel if you would please administer the affirmation. Ms. Folader, please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Elise Folader. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Elise Folader from Eric Polanek, PC, on behalf of the applicant. Um, if you'd like to pull up. Well, could you slow one, one second? I just, uh, I want to thank you for being here today. We have received your, your slideshow presentation for, for this proposal and it appears you're ready. So uh, <laughs> is that a yes? <laughs> yes. A yes. All right. It will, it's going to be displayed on the screen now by thank staff you. and slides will be advanced when you say next. As a reminder to the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony. I think we've actually changed that. We change? No. Okay. Land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now please begin. Thank you so much, Elise Folader again. Um, thank you for having us this morning. Next slide, please. We seek a proposed zoning map amendment that would rezone the area on tax block 16226, slots 25, part of 12, 15, 17, 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23 from R7A C13 to R7A C24. It is located between Rockaway Beach Boulevard and Ocean Common. The original intent was to allow the proposed zoning map amendment to enable the applicant to seek a special permit pursuant to ZR 7336 of the Board of Standards and Appeals to operate a PCE, a physical cultural establishment. While we understand everyone is working on this tax change now, there is a land use rationale to move forward with this rezoning. Next slide. Oh, thank you. As you can see in the slide, the development site is located on lots 25 and 23, which was constructed with an, with an as of right building. Next slide. The proposed action would facilitate two new buildings, or there are two new buildings. You can see what's around them right now on that slide. That rise to eight and four stories respectively on lots 23 and 25. 
and would include 127,799 square feet, 3.99 FAR, with 110,707 square feet of residential space and 17,092 square feet of ground floor commercial space, including 20,947 square feet of cellar parking for residential accessory uses with 108 accessory off-street parking spaces. The proposed action would facilitate a new mixed use development in the project area to contain residential use and commercial retail space and would enable the applicant to pursue a special permit with the BSA pursuant to ZR section 7336 to provide a PCE use. Orange Theory Fitness will be occupying that space. The additional uses permitted by the C24 district would promote the vibrancy of this commercial corridor with increased pedestrian activity as additional commercial uses such as theaters, art studios, and repair shops would be permitted, which are currently lacking given the restrictive nature of the C13 district. The C24 district would allow more types of tenants to occupy the ground floor spaces. In addition, the C24 district enables the possibility to apply for a discretionary special permit a, a demonstrated need given the lack of such facilities present. Therefore, given the similar bulk requirements and enhanced use opportunities, the proposed mixed use district would be consistent with the pre existing mixed use character of each 116th Street. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see, the area that I just described between Ocean Promenade and Rockaway Beach Boulevard, where the rezoning would be. Next slide, please. Uh, here are some photographs of the as, uh, as of right building that is currently constructed on Beach 116th Street. Next slide. And these are the plans. You can go through those quickly. Right. Thank you very much. Um, there are 86 total units in both buildings A and B. It has 78, um, A has 78 and B has eight, all units in contract are in buildings A, um, and the owner is speaking to commercial tenants for the spaces that are not yet occupied. Um, thank you so much, and um, we understand that a lot is happening with the PCE special permit and things are changing, but we still think that the C24 commercial overlay would be great for this area of Rockaway Beach. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, is the development occupied currently? Yeah, there are uh, contracting uh, units, so a bunch are selling, and some of the commercial spaces have been um, occupied, and Orange Theory will go in very, very soon. This was the whole purpose of this rezone. <laughs> um, if the physical cultural establishment tax amendment were approved, would you still need this proposed zoning change to facilitate your project? not to facilitate the PCE, but to have a lot of these other uses I described. So the C24 would allow for more types of uses to go in that ground floor space. Okay. And does the proposed new commercial overlay reduce required commercial parking at this site? Uh, it does, but we are not, we already built the buildings as of right. So there are 108 accessory off street parking spaces pursuant to the old the zone, current zoning. Okay. I have um, no th further questions for the applicant. Um, and once again, I want to um, note, uh, well, there's, there's no, is there any, anybody, Secretary? Okay. Any of the committee members have questions? All right, seeing none, um, I am going to dismiss the applicant. I want to thank you for being here this morning and wish you good luck as you go forward. If there are any uh, remaining members of the public who wish to testify in the 133 Beach 116th Street rezoning, please press the raise hand button now. Or for anybody who may be in the chamber, please see the sergeant at arms now to prepare a speaker card and the meeting will briefly stand at ease.
There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on the Beach uh, 133 Beach 116 Street rezoning proposal under ULERP number C210148ZMQ, the public hearing on this preconceived land use item is now closed and the item is laid over. Uh, I am now going to open the hearing, uh, public hearing on related pre-considered land use items for the 840 Atlantic Avenue rezoning proposal, seeking a zoning map amendment under ULERP number C210249ZMK and a related zoning text amendment under ULERP number N210250ZRK and relating to property in Majority Leader Cumbo's district in Brooklyn. Once again, for anyone following online and wishing to testify remotely today on this item, you must pre-register and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. If you are here today in person and wish to testify, please see the Sergeant in Arms to fill out and submit a speaker card. It's now my pleasure uh, to introduce her comments, our Majority Leader, Ms. Lori Cumbo. Thank you, Councilmember Gredenchik. I appreciate your leadership at this time, and I just want to begin by thanking all of my colleagues for being here today. The 840 Atlantic Avenue application before this committee for public hearing today would facilitate a significant new mixed-use development at the corner of Atlantic and Vanderbilt Avenues, also known to many people as the McDonald's Block. This development site and the south side of Atlantic Avenue from Vanderbilt all the way to Nostrand Avenue is within the M Crown study area where for over five years, Community Board 8 has been working together with my office, the Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, and the Department of City Planning on a proposal to create a dynamic new mixed use neighborhood. This is particularly of interest because we wanted through this particular process to empower the community and to allow the community to create the, the framework in which development happens within the community. It was also an opportunity to empower community boards to be able to shape the future of their community, understanding the needs of that same community by the individuals who actually live there. And from the very beginning of this project, along with Borough President Eric Adams, um, we have spoken enthusiastically about the M Crown being a catalyst for how community boards could work with local elected officials as well as developers to shape what their community should look like and recognizing their needs. This application will help set the precedent for the wider area, and I strongly support Community Board 8, as I have always said from the very beginning, and the Brooklyn Borough President in seeking to ensure that this proposal is consistent with the M Crown Plan. Our offices in the Community Board have spent countless hours in community meetings, building local support and consensus for this vision. I look forward to hearing from the applicant on how they believe their proposal will meet the goals and parameters of the M Crown Plan, which was established long before this application came to the council, and to plan for my constituents and the public on this important development for the future of Community Board 8. And just want to just close by saying it's so important that community boards are empowered to shape their community. They are the ones that live there. They are the ones that have built their communities. And it's so important that their voice be heard and that their vision and plan be articulated. And it is my hope and belief that the M Crown will actually become a designated uh, district within the 35th Council District and will set a precedent for how responsible development can happen all across the city. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. Um, we're going to now proceed with the first panel for this item, which includes Stephanie Marazzi and Ben Stark, Land Use Counsel for the applicant, and Tom Lee for the applicant. This panel will testify remotely, so I will now ask that they be promoted and unmuted, and counsel, if you would please administer the affirmation. 
panelists, please raise your right hands and state your names for the record. Uh, ben Stark uh, from Hershey Singer Epstein. Tom Lee for the applicant. Do we not have Ms. Marazzi? Uh, Ms. Marazzi will not be joining us today. Panelists, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. I thank you, Council. Um, when you uh, now, I want to addressing the panel. When you are ready to present your slideshow for the proposal, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Once again, for the viewing public, anyone wishing to test uh, to obtain an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now, Ms. Marazzi, Mr. Stark, and Mr. Lee, you may begin. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Gredenchik. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction as well. Again, I'm Ben Stark uh, for, from Hershey Singer Epstein for the applicant, uh, Vanderbilt Atlantic Holdings. Uh, uh, when, uh, whenever your staff is ready, please uh, uh, bring our presentation forward. Thank you, thank you. Um, as the introduction uh, went over, this is uh, an application by Vanderbilt Atlantic Holdings to rezone uh, M11 zone property on the, the uh, south uh, uh, east corner of, of Atlantic Avenue and Vanderbilt Avenue in uh, the Prospect Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn. Um, M01 zone land to a C63X zoning district um, as is uh, uh, required uh, under the zoning resolution. The application will also um, establish- Mr. St Mr. Stark, Stark if, if, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, the members of the panel, some of us are having uh, trouble hearing you. I don't know if you can get closer to your mic or I speak a little more slowly. Is, it, is that better, sir? Tad, maybe. You know what? Uh, one moment, sir. Take your time. Is that better, sir? Yeah, I think that's a little better. Majority leader. Give us one second. Give us just one second. This is the brave new age we're in. All right, Mr. Stark, if you could continue, we'll. My apologies, is, is this better? Um, yes. I'll try to speak clearer, louder. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as I said, this is an application as, as uh, uh, warmly introduced by uh, the majority leader to rezone M11 zone land in, in the Prospect Heights neighborhood of, of Brooklyn on the corner of Vanderbilt Avenue, Atlantic Avenue. The application would also establish an MIH area as required by the zoning resolution. Um, and uh, the application would also uh, uh, amend the text of the zoning resolution um, uh, in order to facilitate uh, wider, more pedestrian-friendly sidewalks uh, along Atlantic Avenue and Vanderbilt Avenue. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the application, um, if approved, would facilitate a new 18-story building. Um, uh, that would yield uh, approximately 316 dwelling units, of which uh, 95 would be affordable under MIH option two, um, as the application was, was filed into ULERP. Um, although, uh, as we'll discuss later, the, uh, our applicant team uh, is, is open to uh, uh, MIH option one, of, um, which would yield 79, affordable, approximately 79 affordable apartments. Next slide, please. Uh, I, here we have a rendering of, of, of the building. Um, as you can see in this image, uh, the building as, as uh, proposed uh, fits contextually with, with its uh, immediate surroundings, including uh, uh, constructed buildings to the north uh, on the left-hand side of the image at 809 Atlantic, um, and an existing building to the south on the right-hand side of your image at 550 Vanderbilt. Uh, next slide, please. 
the application at 840 Atlantic Avenue on the, the, uh, the, the southern side of Atlantic Avenue um, is positioned uh, in close proximity to uh, Atlantic Center, about a 10 minute walk to the west, um, and, and is positioned just, just kind of on, on to the southeast of, of, of downtown Brooklyn um, and offers an opportunity to uh, uh, make a significant contribution to uh, the borough's affordable housing uh, shortage. Next slide, please. The application would would zone uh, uh, rezone uh, what we consider to be like a legacy M11 district um, mapped in the early 1960s, um, and which has already started to be uh, rezoned uh, via private applications, including a recent re rezoning directly across the street to the north uh, that made its way through this particular subcommittee um, about a year and a half ago at 809 Atlantic. That's the R9 just to the north of our site, you can see in the right-hand image. Uh, next slide. Uh, the site um, includes a number of different parcels, but as a majority leader introduced, uh, the site is dominated by uh, the drive through McDonald's that uh, many people know and are familiar with. Next slide. And you can see it here in this, this overhead image. Um, and uh, uh, you can see that the, the drive through McDonald's uh, has entrances on Pacific, um, exits on, on both Atlantic and Vanderbilt. Next slide, please. The site um, on the south side of Atlantic is, is ideally suited for uh, a, a dense uh, a mixed use building uh, that is contextual with, with surrounding structures. Uh, next slide. Flipping around to the other side on Vanderbilt, um, this is looking north. Uh, the 809 Atlantic site um, is just in, in the background. Next slide. Bring it around the other side. Uh, we're looking south towards the development site, the 550 Vanderbilt um, uh, building uh, on the right-hand side. Next slide. And you can see, uh, I, we step forward towards the median. Um, the, this is a typical uh, condition of the area as, as many might be familiar with. It's a lot of traffic. Uh, both vehicular and uh, pedestrian. Next slide. Okay, so what makes this application um, uh, 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 appropriate for this particular site? Well, uh, this is a, as I said a second ago, it's an exceptionally busy area, uh, both from a vehicular and pedestrian standpoint. The site uh, positioned between two very wide streets, Atlantic Avenue at 120 feet wide is, um, as many people won't point out to me, is, is wider than Broadway. Uh, Vanderbilt at 100 feet wide uh, uh, bounds the other side of the site. Uh, the, the wide street characteristics give this site uh, the, the potential to uh, provide adequate light and air at the street and pedestrian realm um, while, while remaining contextual with the, the buildings that surround. Uh, the proximity of, of, of transit, multimodal, both uh, subways uh, within a short walk, regional rail, um, and express bus lines also uh, uh, support a, a dense development at, at this location. Uh, next slide. You can see the Atlantic Center um, as provided to us by Google is, is a mere 10 minute walk to the west. Uh, next slide. Uh, Clinton Washington uh, uh, subway station, just, just uh, about a three minute walk to the north. Um, next slide. The surrounding uh, 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 context. Uh, we feel strongly that the, the proposal uh, at C63X, which would yield a 195 foot tall building, is contextually appropriate given um, what is both the existing surrounding context and the future context of the area. 809 Atlantic, which we had discussed a, a second ago, uh, has recently topped out at over 300 feet tall, 550 Vanderbilt directly to the west at, at 205, and our structure will mark a, a, a notable step down at 195 feet. Uh, next slide, please. And this is 809 Atlantic, as I said a second ago. Uh, next slide. Both of the structures um, in one image here, 8, 840 Atlantic in, in, the, uh, in the middle. Next slide, please. So the majority leader had, in introducing this project 
had asked us, well, how does this application fit with, within uh, the M Crown framework? We, we believe that it does. We believe the M Crown framework, which um, was a, 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 a partnership between both the community board and, and the Department of City Planning, identified a number of goals for the wider area. Uh, these goals were both housing related and, um, and uh, uh, more uh, non-residential related. Uh, Atlantic Avenue, on, uh, for its part, um, is, is treated in a number of different ways, uh, or was treated in a number of different ways by, by this, uh, uh, during this process. Uh, certain parts of Atlantic Avenue are identified as being most appropriate for non-residential development. Mo those uh, areas of Atlantic Avenue were mostly to the east, over a half mile from our site, whereas housing development uh, was seen as more appropriate on the western edge of, of the M Crown. This site is on the far, far western edge of, of the M Crown area and has since, at, since the beginning of, of the, M, the M Crown study always been identified as, as, as the location uh, appropriate for the most density. Uh, the reasons for this are the reasons we've already discussed in this presentation. It's the double wide street location, it's the proximity of, of Atlantic Center, uh, and it's the proximity of, of, of uh, other buildings of a, of a, of a tall context. Uh, our application um, would facilitate a building that would fit within that context um, and would meet that, that, that vision that Adam Crown had laid out for this, for this particular site, um, which, as I said a second ago, is appropriate for, for a little bit more density than, than some of the sites on Atlantic to, to the east. Uh, this dynamic of, of 840 being appropriate for a touch more was, was, was discussed in the city, during the city planning commission um, uh, hearings uh, uh, just a, a, a few weeks ago. Um, in fact, uh, during the, the commission's vote on, on the application, uh, members of the, of the commission uh, took, took the opportunity to remind um, uh, stakeholders that uh, whatever zoning is adopted here at 840 does not serve as precedent for the applications um, that would follow. That as uh, council member Gredenchik had pointed out in commenting on the 67th street rezoning, uh, corner sites are, uh, there are, there are land use principles that support corner sites being treated differently than mid-block sites. Um, so we should not feel as though whatever exact zoning is, is established at 840 has to be the zoning that moves east from here. And in fact, that's not what is called for by M Crown. M Crown doesn't identify, does not identify specific, specific zoning districts, but it does uh, suggest a, a general context. Uh, next slide. Yes, and as I said, that corner of Atlantic Ave, oh, okay. Uh, as I had said, the corner of Atlantic and Vanderbilt is the only area in the M Crown, Crown having received um, this particular designation. Um, what it's calling for here is, is more housing. Uh, next slide, please. And as I had said, although the M Crown does not identify specific zoning districts or densities, um, it proposes a, chain, a, cha a change in density at the corner of Clinton Avenue. This is consistent with the existing context on the north side of, of, of Atlantic that yielded uh, uh, the 809 Atlantic project over 300 feet tall um, and is uh, uh, appropriate given, uh, next slide, given the um, positioning of the AC train having, having stations, uh, uh, subway entrances on the corner of Clinton and Fulton. Um, we anticipate that um, as North Prospect Heights uh, uh, continues to fill out, uh, as more development occurs on the south side of Atlantic, that foot traffic will will likely cross Atlantic right at the corner of Clinton um, and and move north to that station, uh, which supports a uh, the proposed uh, 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 context at the corner of, of Vanderbilt and Atlantic. And these principles, as I say here, they guide uh, the zoning that was that was chosen and supported by the City Planning Commission at this location. Next slide. Um, the M Crown uh, uh, framework, as I had said, calls for this this kind of reduction in density moving east, this stepping down towards the east, and and that's that's these are the principles that that guided 
um, how we design this building. We, we designed the building to, to put as much of the density on, on the corner and then, and then step down as we move south and step down as we move, move east. Next slide. We, for in thinking about the context moving east on Pacific, we, we even established uh, with this rezoning uh, uh, or, or maintained with this rezoning, the existing R6B district on, on the Pacific. You can see that the building actually steps down notably to, to uh, uh, only 50 feet in height. Um, uh, uh, along Pacific Street. Uh, that would be contextual with the townhouse character of that, that particular block. Next slide. Um, as I said at the beginning, this application was filed under MIH option two, um, but uh, uh, the applicant is comfortable with, with MIH option one as well. Um, I just wanted to be able to provide for, for quick response um, what, what the anticipated rents would be under MIH option two. Uh, for the uh, uh, approximately 95 affordable housing uh, units that this, this building would provide under that particular option. Next slide. Uh, this project has a series of other commitments. Um, and these commitments, um, in our view, are, uh, are, are supportive of, of, of the relationship between uh, this development and, and the community that, 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 that it will be, that it will share. Uh, this application, uh, will also include, um, uh, or this building will also include uh, two floors of non-residential, um, totaling 50 to 55,000 square feet, um, inclusive of uh, an approximately 8,000 square foot uh, non-for-profit uh, uh, dance studio. Um, the dance studio, uh, we propose to uh, earmark um, for, for a non-profit um, in perpetuity. So although we are negotiating a long-term well below market lease um, to give uh, uh, the community a, a, a comfort that that particular space um, will remain affordable for, for a not-for-profit or an arts-oriented use uh, in perpetuity, we are willing to um, uh, 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 execute and record a restrictive declaration to that effect. Uh, we have a series of other commitments that we have, we have worked through um, in the last few months, including in back and forth with the borough president, president's office. The, the project will, will be built with a more family-friendly unit mix, including above average mix of two and three bedroom apartments. Um, we, we will be uh, uh, agreeing to uh, hire 32BJ building service workers. Uh, we commit to hiring, um, uh, uh, giving preference to LDs and MWBs during the, the construction process. Uh, we're also going to be partnering with a locally based affordable housing nonprofit to serve as the building's um, administering agent and help us with uh, the marketing and promotion of the affordable housing units, especially to the local uh, senior um, population. Um, and also coming out of the, the borough president pro uh, hearing process, uh, we, we refined our, our commitment to, uh, to, uh, to make as part of the, the, the building um, uh, uh, superstructure certain uh, resiliency and sustainability measures. Uh, we're exploring doing both, both a solar uh, array um, uh, as well as uh, working with DEP on, on, on rain gardens at the street level, um, as well as incorporating certain public realm improvements within that, that these wider, more pedestrian friendly sidewalks um, that the application will facilitate. Um, I wanna leave this slide up um, given that, that I'm sure it will come up uh, perhaps during our question and answer period. Um, but by and large, that 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 uh, uh, concludes uh, this introductory presentation, and of, and of course, we're here to, to answer and respond to any questions that are raised. Thank you so much. I thank you, Mr. Stark, for your presentation to the committee. Um, at this time, we are going to uh, hear questions from uh, Majority Leader Cumbo. If you're ready, Majority Leader. Uh, good afternoon, just wanted to um, go right into the height and the density. In 2008, I wrote a letter to the Department of City Planning alongside Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams and the chair of CB8 supporting a commercial zone along Atlantic Avenue with six FAR residential and additional bonus to seven FAR for commercial space as part of the M Crown framework. Did you consider this letter when crafting your application? 
Yes, we did. Thank you, Majority Leader. Yes, we did. We, in thinking about the total floor area that would be appropriate at this location, we ran with the idea that seven was a baseline for Atlantic Avenue as a whole, but that in keeping with the land use principles of a corner site being able to accommodate a slightly more density, we added just about an FAR and a half on the corner. That, we feel, is a way to balance both what is an appropriate context for this location while also achieving or unlocking the potential here to build more housing, basically, to really meet the opportunity. So you had the letter, you reviewed the letter, and then you took it upon yourself and your team to make assumptions about what you thought could be essentially a better letter by proposing the extra density. Because when we look at the M Crown, that particular location fits within the M Crown. There are no variances based off of whether it's in the corner or the middle, or this is what we saw for the entirety of that particular zone. So I just want to be clear because it's very important to understand because in terms of how I like to function as a council member, and I understand the value of people's time, energy, and resources, that we put forward a framework that we wanted the development team to fit within that framework, but you spent time, energy, and resources and calculations on a larger framework, and so now here we are at this particular point. The proposed C6-3X zoning is significantly denser than this at over nine FAR and up to 20 stories. The block immediately south of this site on the east of Vanderbilt is low rise and part of the historic district. Does your design consider any transition to this lower density context? And I saw that you did some step downs in terms of your design and architecture, but can you further address this question? Yes, yes I may. The district immediately to the south of our site can, at least along Vanderbilt Avenue, can yield buildings upwards of 95 feet tall. We, thinking of that, we began, or we designed our building to make steps to kind of within a floor or two of that context. So I don't have the massing of the building up in front of me, but I believe that along the Pacific and Vanderbilt corner, the building steps down to about 110 feet tall, which is about 20 feet taller than the district to the south of us is permitted. So you can see we're kind of making further steps. So as you cross Pacific, it will make a further step to about 95 and then continue from there. So yes, we did try to bring those steps within a floor or two of what then would be permitted across the street. Going into the affordable housing, which MIH option do you propose for the development and why? CB8 and the borough president recommended the deep affordability option be used at this site, 20% at an average of 40 AMI, which reduces the percentage of affordable housing from 25 to 20%, but would require more deeply affordable apartments. Have you considered this request at this time? I know the applicant has. I think this is a great opportunity to interface with my client, the Vanderbilt Atlantic Holdings. Tom, do you want to answer this question about affordability? Sure. And thank you for the question, council member. Our initial proposal was for option two, which would have maximized the number of affordable units. For us, it was important to include as many units as possible. And we have heard the feedback previously that option one is something that we should consider, which we looked at very seriously and certainly open to. With option one, there's actually a portion that is also deeply affordable. 
and also we get the benefit of having a larger number of units. Um, going down to option three, I think we lose another 20 units or so of affordable units. And to us, having a mix from 40% AMI to 60% AMI to 80% AMI is a better choice in a building like this. I appreciate your opinion. Um, however, what we're talking about really here, and, and because of the bedroom mix can change these numbers in many ways, we're talking about a significantly um, larger density for the ability to acquire potentially 15 or 20 units of affordable housing. So it's really that question between um, do we sacrifice the character of this historical community with, the, with greater density for potentially 15 or so additional apartments? Um, and while apartments are certainly important at this time, we also don't want to further erode the character of that community. The buildings that you showed or highlighted in your presentation are not a, a part of the M Crown District. So to continue to encroach upon the M Crown District continues to allow other developers to come in and say, well, look at what happened here on this project. We should be able to do something larger a block away because of what happened at the end point of the M Crown project. So I also wanted to ask if you're proposing to partner with a local not-for-profit organization to be the administering agent for the affordable housing. Yes. And have you identified what that local not-for-profit organization would be? We have a few that we're considering. We have not um, made a selection yet at this stage. Mm -hmm. It's really important for you to understand the local community and what organizations are most qualified to do that work within the community. The M Crown space also calls for a planning vision for mixed use development with housing, jobs, and a diversity of community enhancing uses. Does your proposal meet those goals? And how so? Uh, we believe that it does quite strongly. Uh, our, at, our project is proposed to have uh, two, two full floors of, of non residential uh, uses. Uh, totaling uh, upwards of 55 plus thousand square feet, um, which is a, a significant chunk of, uh, of this building, uh, given that the, the first two floors are, 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 are more full, but whereas the residential floors are, don't occupy the, the entirety of the, of the site. Um, the, of that 55,000 plus square feet, um, uh, we, we intend to uh, 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 develop both uh, space for, like we had talked about, a, a not-for-profit uh, community facility space, uh, 8,000 plus square feet, um, and also uh, space for uh, 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 retailers, including local retailers. We think, at least in relation to M Crown, we think that this mixed-use framework, uh, a mix of commercial community facility and residential uh, uses, is what is appropriate inside of the M Crown for this particular location. Um, as the M Crown study discusses or, or the framework discusses uh, and shows, uh, Atlantic Avenue is not a monolith and neither the, the M Crown is either. There are parts of the M Crown that are more appropriate for industrial uses um, and there are other parts of the M Crown that are more appropriate for a, a transformational community facility space. And a lot of that is very site specific. <clears throat> Uh, industrial uses, for example, um, really are not great when located on, on very wide streets at intersections because of the interaction between uh, uh, deliveries, uh, uh, pedestrian movements on the sidewalk. And so um, when we start to hammer down what the exact uh, best uses are um, for, for, for this particular site, it was clear to us that, that um, a, a transformational community facility space would be what what is appropriate here. You can imagine, um, you know, the population of Prospect Heights is, is 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 growing. People are walking north on Vanderbilt, um, and and right up on the street along these widened sidewalks, we have this great uh, 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 space for for a non-for-profit dance studio, beckoning, pulling people into the building. 
That's kind of our vision in how it lines up with the M. Crown's call for notable non-residential spaces. But haven't you seen on Atlantic Avenue for as long as I can remember, it has been an avenue that's been full of industrial manufacturing uses, so on and so forth. So that has really been a space within Brooklyn, New York, where manufacturing, all types of industrial spaces where there's deliveries, there's pickup, there are all these sorts of spaces that Atlantic Avenue seems like it was almost designed to be. The idea of the residential is in many ways a new concept, more so than the industrial and the retail. Outside of the not-for-profit space, what other uses are you considering for the remainder of the 40,000 plus square feet? Sorry, we're losing the signal, I see. Excuse me? We're, the city council, we're seeing cutting in and out for a few seconds there. We have, we're considering ground floor retail with other commercial uses on the second floor, potentially having office space on the second floor. Have you been in discussions with any particular companies, organization, or have you even thought about what the mix should even be in terms of, are you looking at a supermarket? You may not know the supermarket, but are you looking at a supermarket? Are you looking at a doctor's office? Are you looking at a gym or a daycare? Or what are, this, what are some of the uses that you're looking at? Are you looking at a, a craft studio or those sorts of uses? Um, we, we have had preliminary conversation with a grocery store to potentially take a portion of the space. Um, we would like to think we have a variety of tenants, not just one or two for the ground floor space. It's quite a big site, size. Um, we would like to have some local restaurants, food and beverage options, maybe a pharmacy. But I think the key point is to have a mix. Since as part of our application, we're also widening the sidewalk. We want to make sure this whole corner becomes more pedestrian friendly. The building interacts with the public. It's not just uh, unused commercial space. Are you willing to enter into a binding agreement to memorialize a commitment to low cost art space as you have proposed today in this hearing? Is this on top of the community facility we propose for this, creative outlets or? This is the, at this time, this is the low cost art space that you have uh, discussed in terms of your partnership with Creative Outlet Dance Company. Yes, we will be willing to enter a binding agreement. Now let's say Creative Outlet stays there for 10 years and they outgrow the space and they decide they want to move into another space somewhere else. What will then happen to that space? It will remain permanently affordable. Um, we will have it open for the next growing local nonprofit to take the space. And it will be, I think we'll be very happy to see that Creative Outlet outgrows the space. I think they have a very good organization that, you know, some point in the near future, uh, moving to a bigger space. But, but this will stay permanently affordable for the community. How do you incrementally decide um, what the increase in space rental costs will be? So in other words, is it gonna be, let's say 1.3% every year? And even after a change from one space to the next space, wanting to ensure that there's not some dramatic jump in terms of what the increase for the space rental would be between one tenant to the other tenant. I think we will follow some kind of increase based on a CPI. Mm -hmm. So that attracts inflation. Um, it's really to recover basic costs for having that space. Not, there's, there's, uh, in fact, I think we're losing a very significant amount of money to build a space, but it's, it's a good space to have. Do you have a plan in place to ensure local hiring and MWBE participation during construction? Yes, we are. We want to meet certainly the city and state requirements. Um, we want to see that. I think in the past we've seen those numbers exceeded. And in terms of building services, we're working with 32BJ to identify local members to uh, staff the building once the building is complete. 
How many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? Uh, the signal is cutting it out, so I didn't hear the question. Excuse me, I didn't hear you. The signal cut out for a few seconds again. Could you repeat the question? My question was, how many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? How many people do you plan to hire from the local community as it pertains to construction on this site? I think there's a percentage that's... <laughs> Sorry, the signal keeps on cutting out. Are you not able to hear my question? No, you, you're, the city council screen keeps on going to no signal in and out constantly. So, so can you hear me at this point? Yes. Um, I think it would be, you know, area between 30 plus percentage from uh, LBE and WMBEs. Mm -hmm. How can we ensure follow-up and progress reports on these commitments? I'm sure we can work out a, a system to track that and to ensure that happens. Um, I don't, uh, I think HPD and other city programs have monitoring programs pertaining to these requirements. So I just want to ensure with this that the, the ability to hire locally is going to be really a foremost concern. As we've seen with uh, a lot of the issues that are happening in our communities, uh, a lot of the violence that we're seeing um, is happening in our communities is traced most back fundamentally to a lack of jobs and opportunities within our communities. So the ability to hire local um, supersedes almost all aspects of any project that we do at this point because we want to ensure that the local community um, is benefiting from the growth and the development that they're seeing in their own communities. So a, a real plan on local hiring with real partners and we can help you identify who those partners should be um, is going to be critical in moving forward um, and also achieving my support as well as the support of this council. And just finally going into sustainability and resiliency, what sustainability and resiliency measures are incorporated into the building's design and construction, such as incorporating blue, green, white roof treatment, passive house, rain gardens, solar panels, or wind turbines? I think the easy question is all of the above, all the items you just stated. I think we are incorporating all of those into the design of the building. Um, I think it makes perfect sense to have a white roof, uh, um, solar panels. I think we considering a vertical wind turbine as part of the design. And you know, rain garden is very important to have to make sure there's no excess runoff of water, rainwater. So I, the, the short answer is all of those items are being considered as part of the building design. Okay. Um, I don't have any further questions. I just want to um, reiterate, as I have stated earlier, um, my position stands with the borough president in the letter that we wrote in 2018. We were clear then, we're clear today, and we're hoping to turn the tide as far as the empowerment of our community boards to shape the communities that they actually live in versus where the developers actually live. It's important that we empower the neighborhoods where um, this development is happening so that people understand and know that they have power to shape their community and its surrounding environment. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader Cumbo, uh, for your questions uh, this day. Uh, I have a few questions for the panel and um, the first question I have, uh, could you confirm that in the portion of the site that fronts on Atlantic and at or near the rear lot line where there appears to be a one-story building portion, could you just confirm that you are subject to in compliance with the transition rule? Uh, if you, and if you, if you're having difficulty with that question, I would request that you answer um, the committee staff in writing. Yeah, we're, we're, sure. Happy, sure. we're happy to follow up with, with committee staff on that question, but 
Um, yeah, the, the short answer I can give is, is that um, if adopted, if the C63X zoning is adopted, we of course have to comply with the transition rule, the maximum height transition rule on the portion of the building in the R6B district and the portion of the building in the C63X adjacent to the R6B district. And compliance would of course be enforced by the Department of Buildings during a zoning review and we have to comply. Okay. All right. So the staff will be waiting for that answer. You showed the unit mix for option two. Can you share with us the breakdown for option one with regard to studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, et cetera? We presented option two. We're happy to follow up with council staff on what the breakdown would be for option one. As we had said that we intend with this particular development to have a higher proportion of two and three bedroom apartments. And of course that will influence what the proportions of two and three bedroom apartments will be for the affordable units, which as we all know under HPD regs, they kind of relatively have to mirror one another. So we can put together a kind of a mock-up of what the breakdowns would be for our unit mix and then what the associated rents would be. Okay. Thank you. With regard to parking, how much will be required? And I understand it's 40% of market unit rates, but about 95 spaces. Will this parking be built below grade? And did you consider applying for a special permit to waive parking requirements? I mean, I can answer the second question, which is no. There is no special permit here to waive parking. As you noted, the parking requirement for the market rate units is 40%. The parking requirement for the affordable units is notably less given the project's positioning within the transit zone. The amount of parking that overall will actually be required is a function of the number of market rate units, the number of affordable units, and also the size and typology of the non-residential uses. So we can, in say sharing with council staff, a proposed unit mix under MIH option one, we can also make an estimation on what the associated parking requirements would be using the MIH option one affordable housing figures. And to answer the first part of the question, we're currently contemplating, or as the building is designed, 90 parking spaces below grade. And when we were speaking with people from the community, people who live in adjacent buildings, as developers, we would be happy to not build parking. We've met with people in the community that express interest that there's a shortage of parking spaces in the neighborhood, and they would like to see this building with a few parking spaces that can be used by tenants who are not living in this building, so other people can use these parking spaces. All right, thank you for answering those questions and for answering the majority leader's questions. At this time, we have no further questions of this panel, and the panel is excused. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have the name? Michael Tongs, William Tongs, oh, she's by herself. All right, the first public panel on this item will include and will be Ethel Tice, and then the following panel will be William Thomas and Austin Celestin. So, and again, I want to, well, we're going to promote those.
Okay, Ms. Tyus is unavailable uh, at this time, so we're going to go to um, the second panel, which I believe is here with us in the chamber today, uh, William Thomas and Austin Celestin. Please step forward. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is William Thomas. I'm here to support the project as a, re a representative and the executive director of Open New York. We're an independent grassroots pro-housing organization. Uh, we support 840 Atlantic because allowing more homes here would help uh, both to alleviate New York's housing shortage and help to fight high rents and displacement. I believe everyone knows on some level that New York has a terrible housing shortage, but let me throw out some numbers to remind everyone how bad it is. Uh, between 2010 and 2017, median rents increased by more than double median wages. Homelessness has reached the highest level since the Great Depression. Pre-COVID, one out of every 10 elementary school students in New York City public schools attended from homeless shelters. In this environment, we need every bit of affordable housing we can muster, and the 95 below market units that this rezoning offers is a great place to start. Uh, that said, allowing more market rate homes in Prospect Heights, an objectively wealthy enclave of the city, will also help by preventing displacement in other neighborhoods. Uh, the census tract for the rezoning area has a median household income of over six figures. Uh, Prospect Heights is a very desirable neighborhood, and although it would be likely many families' first choice, if they can't find a place to live here, they'll simply move to a more affordable neighborhood. As that displaced demand increases, up goes the rent, forcing current tenants to allocate ever larger shares of their incomes to stay in their homes and knocking those who can't pay to the street. If we don't let young professionals live here, they're not going to disappear. They're going to continue to gentrify neighborhoods further in Brooklyn, like Crown Heights, Bed-Stuy, and Brownsville. Uh, by contrast, every new home here will spare a family that pressure. Uh, to put it bluntly, we live in a city where there aren't enough homes for the people who want to live here. It has horrifying human consequences. I know this is a little denser than what the M Crown study called for, uh, but the scale of the housing crisis, I think, really demands we think bigger. Uh, in addition, uh, Borough President Adams just won the Democratic primary on a housing platform, specifically calling for upzoning wealthy neighborhoods for affordable housing. I hope his election can give us the confidence uh, to move forward on that platform, even if it's not exactly what the community board envisioned. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony this morning and for being with us today at City Hall. Mr. Celestin? Um, can you hear me? Good? Yes. Okay. Um, good. Oh, good afternoon. I wrote this three minutes ago. It's like good morning. Uh, my name is Austin Celestin. I am a NYU student studying urban design. Um, when hearing conversations about projects like this and other projects across the city, I always hear precedent, zoning, context, and character. Can you speak a little closer to the mic? Yeah, sorry. Perfect. Um, but I just wanted to ask, we fight so vehemently to defend character and context and zoning, but at what cost? In the past five decades, not one of the past five decades, we have built more housing than we did during the Great Depression. If we were to cobble together the total number of units built in the last 50 years, we built less housing in the past 50 years than we did in just the 1920s. This has resulted in once middle-class neighborhoods turning into exclusive affluent enclaves out of reach for pretty much anyone not making six figures. It has also resulted in the gentrification of a myriad of neighborhoods across the city. Maybe it is a little bit taller than the surrounding area, but every little bit of housing is going to contribute to tackling the housing crisis that I'm sure all of you can acknowledge that we're undergoing right now. Prospect Heights has a six-figure median income and is disproportionately white, no matter how you spend it. In the city, in the borough, on Long Island, 55% white is much higher than the city's average. 95%, 95 affordable units will go a long way or at least a short way to contributing to solving this housing crisis. It's also worth mentioning that those 95 units of affordable housing would be in walking distance from the C train, the G train, and a short walk from the 2, 3, B, and the Q. You also have access to much needed green space at Prospect, Pites, Prospect Park. I'm sorry. It might be a small drop in the bucket, but any bit of housing is housing much needed. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today, and every drop helps, believe us. Um, the next panel is going to be a remote panel, and it consists of Jamel Gaines, Kate Griffler, Marissa Williams, and Deja Miller. I remind the panelists that we have two minutes for each public speaker. Your time will begin. Mr. Gaines? Yes, hey, I'm sorry. Um, it, it kind of blacked out, sorry about that. No can worries. You hear me? Yes, we can. can. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Jamel Gaines. I'm the Artistic Executive Director of Creative Outlet. We've been a staple in Brooklyn for now 27 years. Um, part of our artistic and cultural mission through the arts is about education, um, getting young people and professionals to um, Broadway, television, and film. Also um, cultivating people to entrepreneurs, using the arts as a, as a, as a vehicle to get um, the community involved in many different activities as well. We are for the, the, the project. We're looking forward to having a home in downtown Brooklyn. We've been in Brooklyn before all the development has happened in the last 15 or so years. So um, we're excited about the project and we um, want to stay here in Brooklyn and grow with the Brooklyn community. Thank you, Mr. Gaines, for your testimony. Ms. Griffler? Your time will begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Griffler. I am an associate producer as well as a dancer for Creative Outlet. Um, I'm in favor of this project. We've been working with Tom Lee on getting a space, a home base for Brooklyn for our dance artists and the community. And uh, we're very, very looking forward to this home. Uh, Creative Outlet is an organization that is deeply rooted in the Brooklyn community, especially works with communities of, of color. And um, our institution would, institution would not only help professional dance artists, but students, adults, um, young artists. We offer scholarship programs and we offer under market value costs for our classes. Um, as Jamel said, many of our artists go on to Broadway, theater, film, TV. And as far as creating jobs, um, we would probably bring in 25 to 30 teaching artists, 10 administrators. Uh, we would bring in probably 50 to 100 summer youth employment students as well. And we are really looking forward to creating a community here in Brooklyn. Um, as a dancer myself, I have to train in Manhattan because there are not classes available for me to train as a professional dancer in Brooklyn. Um, although Mark Morris is very close, they don't, they don't offer the types of classes I need to be a dancer and make it in New York City. Also, Brooklyn doesn't have a Black-led um, dance organization and our, our community is mostly made up of people of color and they need a home base and they need an art center that would appropriately cater to their needs. So we hope that we will get our space. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Griffler. Uh, Ms. Williams? Your time will begin. Good afternoon, my name is Marissa Williams and I am a representative of 32BJ. I am here today on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed project at 840 Atlantic Avenue. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. 32BJ has more than 3,000 members who live or work in Community Board 8 and we believe that the best way to make sure that developments like the one proposed have a positive impact on building, uh, 
on building service workers and the community is for developers to make a formal commitment to pay the prevailing wage. In light of this, we are pleased to let you know that the developer affiliated with this project, Vanderbilt Atlantic Holdings LLC, has made an early commitment to creating prevailing wage building service jobs at this site. The developer has a longtime partnership with 32BJ and a track record of creating good jobs throughout their portfolio. We estimate that this will lead to the creation of five new building service jobs, and we are fully in support of this project. We have full confidence that Vanderbilt Atlantic Holdings will be a responsible employer and presence in the community. We know that this development will continue to uphold the industry standard and provide opportunities for working families to thrive in Crown Heights. On behalf of 32BJ SEIU, I respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And Deja Miller now. Your time is here. Uh, my name is Deja Miller. I've been dancing with Creative Outlet since I was seven years old. I'm 18 years old now. So I thought it was really important that I come here and let everyone know that Creative Outlet getting their own building and space to flourish should be really, really good for the community. And I know firsthand because of what they've done for me. Like I said, I've been dancing with them since I was seven years old. And my personal story, is that my family isn't the most perfect, but whenever I'm able to speak to Jamel or some of the other professional artists, I always feel like I have a safe space and I feel like it's really important that the entire community is able to have access to that. Because not only am I now going on to do musical theater in college, but I know teachers that have now started their own dance programs and they're acting and they're singing and now they're professionals at what they do on Broadway. And it's really important that we open our arms and minds to help um, people that might not be as fortunate as everyone else so that they also have that outlet. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, this panel is now dismissed. I'm gonna introduce the next panel. Cynthia McKnight, Dove Fetter, Daniel Rogoff, and Douglas Hanau. And when we're ready to begin, uh, Cynthia McKnight will be first. Your time will begin. Um, good morning, everyone. Well, actually, it's good afternoon now. My name is Cynthia McKnight, and I'm here on behalf of Community Education Council 13. I'm a parent leader and also the former uh, PTA president at PS11 and Dock Street School. I'm also a resident of District 35. I'm here on behalf of the parents, the teachers, and the community members who could not attend this meeting. I'm also a union leader for AFGE Local 913 of HUD, Housing and Urban Development. And I can, just, I can say that our community desperately need um, affordable housing. There's a lot of families who cannot afford to stay in District 35. I help a lot of families look for affordable units and it's very dear, um, dire need for this. So I'm pleading for the approval of this plan in order for our families to take advantage of great schools in District um, 13. Um, and also um, with HUD, we are releasing a lot of vouchers um, through President Biden's plan, and it would be a shame that people would have to stay in high um, poverty areas. Um, so please approve this uh, plan. Thank you. Majority Leader Cumbo. Just want to say hello to Cynthia McKnight. Always an honor to have the hardest working woman in District 35 here with us today, and your testimony of course, is a very important one and will be weighted heavily. Always an honor to work with you and to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader, and thank you, uh, Ms. McKnight. Uh, Dove Fetter. Your time will begin.
All right. Um, we'll see if we uh, get Mr. Fetter back. In the meantime, uh, Daniel Rogoff. Hi. Good time. Uh, thank you for thank you for your time. Um, I, I'm a lifelong Brooklynite. My parents immigrated here from Lebanon. I was born in Brooklyn. I grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, I live my life here pretty much exclusively uh, outside of college. Um, right now, I live in Fort Greene. My wife works at Maimonides, uh, and w w my entire family, including my three-year-old son, uh, love it here. And my vision for my life since uh, day one was to settle down um, and grow up, raise a family here in Brooklyn the same way I did, and in close proximity to my parents, my siblings, my wife's siblings. Um, but I'm reaching the bitter realization that um, I don't know how feasible that is. And there's a very simple reason. Housing is outrageously expensive. Um, I have to earn on the order of a million dollars a year uh, to afford uh, a home for a family of four in Fort Greene. Um, it's it's not feasible. Um, and, and projects like this one would alleviate that burden in a major way. Uh, I'm eagerly awaiting the day when our elected officials start prioritizing people and families over the historical character of neighborhoods uh, and don't roll their eyes at the prospect of an additional 15 or 20 uh, affordable apartments that could help families like mine uh, settle down and live in the city. Uh, the same way I'm eagerly awaiting the day when my own elected uh, council members uh, start representing the thousands of people like me in their choices for community board members uh, and when those community boards actually start representing the needs of the people in, in their communities and not their own personal ones. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Daniel. Have you ever actually been outside of Brooklyn? <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, yeah, I'm college, teasing you. <laughs> it was nice, uh, they, let, they let people build houses there. <laughs> well, welcome, your, your thoughts will be, your desires will certainly be weighted, and we thank you so much for your testimony and for being on this Zoom for over two hours, um, awaiting your time to speak, and we'll certainly take into consideration um, your uh, testimony here today. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Majority Leader. And now, Doug Hanau, Douglas Hanau. Your time yes, hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Douglas Hanau. I've lived in Brooklyn only 25 years, but I have lived in New York City my whole life. I used to live in Queens. I love a good meeting where we talk about uh, material and we talk about transitioning to the historic district and how the buildings look. But this is about people. This is about human beings and the ability of human beings to live in New York City, the most wonderful city that's given me everything. I, I'm raising two amazing children here. I am lucky enough to have bought a house 25 years ago in Brooklyn. I didn't do anything special. I didn't build this community. I bought a house, the neighborhood turned fancy and I'm a be benefiting from that. It really wasn't anything I did, but I want my kids and I want my kids' friends and their future colleagues and the people they work with and people who do not live in New, New York City but come here for a million reasons, to work, to get away from small towns, to enjoy the arts and the culture, they won't get a chance if we don't build projects, this project and projects like this all over the city. I want this, that this has to happen. We can't stop this because it doesn't transition properly to the neighborhood across the street. This is about people and people cannot come to New York to live anymore because it's too expensive. So we need more housing, we need more affordable housing, we need more housing close to transportation to address climate change, to address the, the, the car culture that we live in. We have to move away from cars, move to public transportation, move to housing, a lot of it affordable, much of it not, that's fine too. So please, please, please pass this. And it's, you know, no project is perfect. No project is gonna meet everybody's needs and wants, but this is a great project and it's a great starting point for Brooklyn and for New York City, thank you. Thank you. For the record, I've never lived in Brooklyn, but 
I, I was born in the Bronx and have lived my entire life in Queens. I thank you uh, all for testifying this morning. We have one more panel um, that we're going to hear from, at least, and that consists of David Ratner, William Meehan, and Joe Garzon. So um, if we could have David Ratner. Mr. Meehan, if you'd like to start. Your time will begin. Sure. Um, hi, my name is William Meehan. I'm a Prospect Heights resident, and I'd like to voice my support for 840 Atlantic. Um, I think this project is exactly the kind of new building that the neighborhood needs. Um, we're a wealthy neighborhood, tons of resources, like 10 or so subway lines, um, and those below market rate apartments will help welcome lower income families who are currently priced out. Um, I would like to request that the developer consider MIH option one so that these homes would be available to people who really need that subsidy and reduce class segregation in the neighborhood. Um, but to maintain that higher number of affordable units, I'd like for them to apply for a parking waiver. Um, some people claim this building is too big and dense for the local community, but at the end of the day, the density is what makes New York City the best city in the country and you know, possibly the world, some people think. Um, and the people who live at 840, Vander, uh, 840 Atlantic will help make Vanderbilt Avenue, Atlantic Avenue, and the open street even more lively and enjoyable. Um, not to mention the existing use of this site, if we, can, if we don't approve, um, it is a huge parking lot. Uh, it's terrible to walk past. It's really hot now with the asphalt in the summer, and you're at constant risk of getting run over by someone getting their McNuggets. Um, so the building with the wider sidewalks would be a massive improvement. Um, and my request about the parking um, is that the developer completely eliminate the parking spots. Um, while some members who might have a car themselves uh, might want more parking so there's less competition for those spaces, um, studies show that when you provide parking, just the residents will buy it up and there will be more cars spewing CO2 and PM2.5 particles. Um, the zoning, um, it should be, you know, garages should, are expensive to build and we're weighing car storage against homes for people and i want them to prioritize people over cars um, especially when there's like 10 subway lines right next door um, so besides the parking i think this is a good project just really try and maximize uh you know affordability here um, but i look forward to having these residents as my neighbors i thank you for your testimony uh, uh mr mean and uh, thank you for for your patience today and in, in waiting to testify um, I don't believe, uh, is Mr. Garzon here? I don't think he's with us. I don't see him. Okay. If there are any remaining members of the public who wish to testify on the 840 Atlantic Avenue rezoning proposal, Please press the raise hand button now, or for those who might be here in the chambers, please see the sergeants now to prepare a speaker card, and the meeting will briefly stand at ease. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on the 840 Atlantic Avenue rezoning proposal under ULARP's number, ULARP numbers C210249ZMK and N210250ZRK, the public hearing on these pre-considered land use items uh, is now closed and the items are laid over.
I want to remind uh, New Yorkers that you may submit written testimony to the council by email uh, at landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. I want to thank my colleagues, Ms. Cumbo, the Majority Leader, for being with me here this morning and this afternoon. This concludes today's business of the Land Use Subcommittee of the New York City Council. I thank my colleagues who were present today, the Subcommittee Council, Land Use and other Council staff, and of course the Sergeant at Arms for participating in today's meeting. And now this meeting is hereby adjourned at 12.25 p.m. <laughs>